Hi from New Delhi, you're watching DD India News Ideas Voice to the World. I'm Lipakshi Kurana coming up in the next hour. Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico out of danger after being shot multiple times. Government confirms it as a political assault. Biden, Putin and European leaders condemn the attack. Russian President arrives in China to deepen strategic partnership with counterpart Xi Jinping. Putin earlier expressed readiness for talks on Ukraine on Chinese proposal. Ukrainian President Zelensky delays travel amid deteriorating situation in Kharkiv region. Russian forces capture two more settlements in Kharkiv's outskirts. Military leaders of NATO meet in Brussels. Israeli military calls for investigation after releasing videos showing armed men at UN facility in Gaza while fighting in Gaza intensifies. Hamas says Israeli amendments on ceasefire proposal led to deadlock. India to host Bharat Parv at Khan's Film Festival for the first time. Official poster and trailer of the 55th International Film Festival of India to be unveiled today. Well, on to the details now. Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico is no longer in a life-threatening condition after he was shot in an assassination attempt. The gunman shot Fico five times, initially leaving the Prime Minister in critical condition and undergoing surgery hours later on Wednesday evening. The shooting occurred after Fico attended a government meeting in Handlova. Police said the 71-year-old shooter is in custody, while the motive remains unclear so far. Officials said no one else was injured in the attack. Slovakia's Minister of Defence Robert Kalanick told a press conference that the shooting of Prime Minister Robert Fico was a political assault. Thank you. Look, we're just talking about the level of democracy, about capability to understand each other, to accept the other opinion, and not only one is that good one. If somebody has a different opinion, it's also, he has also his place on, on, on the earth and all, all in the political field. So this is the issue, what's happened, it's a political assault. It's, it's Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin joined Slovakia's EU partners in expressing shock and condemnation of the shooting. European Commission President Ursula Warden Leon also condemned the assault. FICO was elected Prime Minister in October after running a campaign that criticized Western support for Ukraine. The European country is a member of NATO and the European Union and has little history of political violence. And Russian President begins a state visit to China on Thursday. Ahead of the visit, Putin praised Russia-China relations, saying they have reached the highest level ever, despite the difficult global situation that continues to get stronger. Putin also expressed readiness for talks on Ukraine on Chinese proposal. Despite economic ties growing stronger, the U.S. sanctions have led to Chinese fears of secondary sanctions, with a clear dip in Chinese exports to Russia in March and April. The Chernyshova has more from Russia. Russian President Vladimir Putin chose China for his first overseas trip in a new term, a sign of strategic importance of ties between Moscow and Beijing. The two-day state visit will see discussions on international and regional issues, including Ukraine and Middle East. Moscow says China and Russia play a crucial role in balancing world affairs. Putin thanked China for its stance on Ukraine and said Russia has a positive assessment of China's approach to solving the Ukrainian crisis. He noted that Beijing truly understands its root causes and its global geopolitical meaning. Trade is also high on the agenda of the negotiations. Trade turnover reached a record high of 240 billion US dollars in 2023. The sides aim for more.
Russia has become not only an important supplier of energy resources to China, but also increased its supplies of agricultural products by 53% last year. A large volume of bilateral documents, including commercial ones, has been prepared for Putin's visit. Putin will also hold talks with Chinese Premier Li Xian and visit Habrin to take part in the opening of the 8th Russian-Chinese Expo and the 4th Russian-Chinese Forum on Interregional Cooperation. Dasha Chernyshova reporting in Moscow for DD India. And Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky postponed all his foreign trips as Ukraine's battlefield situation continued to deteriorate on Wednesday. And Kyiv said fighting raged in the northeastern border town of Ovchansk in Kharkiv region. The capture of the town five kilometers from the border would be Russia's most significant gain since the war began. A late night report issued by Ukraine's general staff said its troops had repelled four Russian attacks along the border, but fighting was raging near a string of villages. Troops continue to carry out a stabilizing moves near Wovchansk. The report said heavy fire had prompted the military to reposition some troops near Kupiansk to the southeast, an area that has seen heavy fighting in recent months. And Russian forces have taken control of two more settlements in Ukraine's northeast Kharkiv region and one in the southern Zaporizhia region. The defense ministry said on Wednesday, building on a runoff incremental gains that have alarmed Kyiv. The defense ministry said in a statement that units from Russia's north military grouping had captured the settlements of Helevok and Lukyansi in Kharkiv region. The ministry spoke of heavy fighting in other parts of Kharkiv region too, where it said Russian forces had repelled three Ukrainian counter-attacks. The Ukrainian military said late on Tuesday that Ukrainian troops had pulled back to more advantageous positions in two areas of the Kharkiv region. And U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Wednesday announced a $2 billion fund to help Ukraine build up its defense industrial base as he concluded a two-day key visit. Blinken said the United States was working to quickly get more ammunition and weapons to the front lines to help Ukrainian forces fight a new Russian attacks in northeastern Kharkiv region. A U.S. official said $1.6 billion of the $2 billion was earmarked in the supplemental funding bill signed by U.S. President Joe Biden last month and the remaining $400 million is from existing foreign military financing funds that had not yet been allocated. The move follows a U.S.-Ukrainian agreement signed in December to speed weapons co-production and data sharing to help Ukraine's defense industry. And the military leaders of NATO will meet in Brussels to discuss the defense of the alliance and support for Ukraine. This comes as Russian invaders continue to advance towards Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv. Alex Cardia reports for more from Brussels. Well, a big focus for this meeting of NATO's military committee will, of course, be Ukraine. We know that uh, Russian invading forces are moving closer to the uh, second largest city in Ukraine, in Kharkiv. We know that Ukrainian forces have been able to push back some of that Russian advance in some of the neighboring villages, but it will be a real concern. We also know that Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has cancelled several international trips, including one to Spain and possibly one to here in Belgium, uh, very much concerned with the situation in his country. And that will be the case for those NATO military leaders, the uh, more than 30 members of the NATO alliance gathering those uh, top military commanders, coordinating their efforts both for the defense of the alliance, but also uh, for support for Ukraine. We know that has been a top priority for Secretary General and for Rob Bauer, the chair of NATO's military uh, commander as well. And we know the United States announcing just in the last couple of days an extra two billion dollars in military support for Ukraine, certainly a much needed boost. We know the Ukrainians have also said they need more equipment to push back this Russian advance. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the defense of the NATO alliance will also be a really important topic discussed by these military leaders here in Brussels. We know that as a defensive alliance, it is now renewing what it calls its regional plans, its plans for the defense of Europe, should there be an attack on this continent. That will be discussed all in the run-up to a summit of NATO leaders in Washington, D.C. in July. But in the short term, the focus remains very squarely on Ukraine.
Alex Kadye in Brussels reporting for DD India. Well, the Israeli military is calling on the United Nations to investigate the presence of armed terrorists at a UN facility in southern Gaza. The call for probe came after it released a drone footage filmed on May 11th showing armed men at the facility. UNRWA, the main UN agency operating in Gaza, said it is unable to verify the authenticity or the content of the video, but said it is likely that the video shows in UNRWA warehouse that was evacuated last week. Meanwhile, UNRWA has condemned the use of UN facilities by any party to the conflict for military or fighting purposes. It also reiterated call on all parties to the conflict to respect the sanctity and neutrality of UN installations. And fighting between Israel and Hamas has intensified in Gaza after Israel launched precise operations in eastern Rafah, asserting that there were hostages still held by Hamas in the area. Meanwhile, the ongoing ceasefire negotiations in Gaza reached a deadlock on Wednesday after Hamas chief Ismail Hanigay rejected Israel's demand on excluding the terror group in the post-conflict settlement in Gaza. And earlier, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu asserted that eliminating Hamas in the Gaza Strip was necessary for any alternative Palestinian governance there. Eliminating Hamas is an essential step in order to ensure that on the day after, there will be no element in Gaza that can threaten us. Until it is clear that Hamas does not control Gaza militarily, Nobody will be prepared to take upon himself the civil management of Gaza out of fear for their lives. Therefore, all the talk about the day after, while Hamas remains intact, will remain mere words devoid of content. Well, the 22-member Arab League is hoping to agree on how to end the conflict between Hamas and Israel at a summit in Bahrain on Thursday. Confidence is high that a meaningful plan with all members in agreement will be the outcome. Stuart Smith reports from Baghdad in Iraq. The task these leaders have set themselves is huge, but unusually for the question of Palestine-Israel relations, all members from Saudi Arabia to Syria are reportedly on board. Officials say a concrete timetable for a ceasefire in Gaza will be proposed, as well as an initiative to rebuild the Gaza Strip, Rafah and other areas affected by the war. A peace conference will be planned, one which Bahrain will lead as the country's hosting this year's summit. Over the next few months, it would push for Palestine to be recognized as a state, perhaps in return for all Arab nations recognizing Israel as a state for the first time too. That would come with the condition that Hamas be stripped of all authority in Gaza and governance there handed over to the Palestinian Authority, with Hamas to blame for initiating the attack against Israel last October. Unlike in previous years and at previous peace conferences, there is optimism such a proposal will make progress after 143 members of the United Nations voted that Palestine should be granted full membership privileges. Objections from Israel and the US are likely to remain, but leaders hope a United Arab League will ramp up the pressure on them to soften their positions. Representatives will also discuss Iran-Israel relations, the crises in Libya, Yemen and Syria, the conflict in Sudan and a border dispute between Djibouti and Eritrea. Stuart Smith in Baghdad, reporting for DD India. While well, still to come on DD India News Hour. We'll tell you the latest about the hush money trial case as Michael Cohen to testify today. France declares state of emergency in New Caledonia following deadly riots. Ministers hold crisis meeting. And Netherlands is all set to have the most right-wing government in the country in decades. Voice of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India.
You watching the India News I'm Lipak Shikurana and moving on Islamic State says it's behind an attack which killed a commanding officer and four soldiers in Iraq while the country declared victory against the Islamist militants in 2017 there remain cells within the country that occasionally carry out violent attacks Did India Stewart has more from Iraq's capital Baghdad place against an army post in a part of rural northeastern Iraq. Baghdad claimed its troops repelled the attack, but not before five were killed and five others were wounded. Later, Islamic State said it had targeted the barracks using machine guns and grenades in what authorities here are calling a terror attack. In response, they have launched a counter operation. Islamic State killed thousands of civilians in the country from 2014 as its leaders and fighters attempted to create an Islamic caliphate in Iraq and Syria while the US now characterizes Islamic state or Daesh as it's also known as largely contained it maintains around 2 and 1/2000 troops in the country ostensibly to support Iraq taking on the threat but the Iraqi prime minister has repeatedly said he wants US troops out though hasn't made any formal attempt to force them to go Stuart Smith in Baghdad reporting for DD India Well a flotilla of about 100 mostly small fishing boats led by Filipino activists has set sail for a disputed shoal in the South China Sea. The Philippine Coast Guard and Navy deployed one patrol ship each to keep watch from a distance on the activists and fishers who set off on wooden boats with bamboo outriggers on Wednesday to assert Manila's sovereignty over the Scarborough Shoal. After international arbitration in 2013, Scarborough Shoal was declared a traditional fishing area for Chinese, Filipino and Vietnamese fishers. However, China continues to defy it. And for more on this, Laura Westbrook joins us from Hong Kong. Well, Laura, uh, Manila and uh, Beijing have been embroiled uh, in heated standoffs over competing claims over the South China Sea. What do you have to say about the latest move to ensure safety of the civilian mission? Yes, this is a civilian-led mission that involves some 100 small fishing boats and they're sailing towards the Scarborough Shoal. Now, the Scarborough Shoal is a key flashpoint between China and the Philippines. It's a prime fishing patch, it's near uh shipping lanes and it's within uh the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. Now, this uh mission involves uh civil society groups in from the Philippines. Uh they're bringing food and fuel supplies to fishermen there but they're also bringing boys with markers to drop into the ocean uh with the words this is ours now this is a clear message to china that uh is 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 really something that they want to that is not that is going to upset china and we are seeing uh ch- the chinese coast guard uh following this flotilla um as well as it's also being escorted by the philippine coast guard and navy now according to state media uh there have been radio exchanges between the two sides and st- according to chinese state media uh china has said that it will enforce its rights in the area it claims nearly all of the south china sea despite the philippine having competing claims all right can this mission laura uh, lead to further escalation as the 100 small fishing boats uh, are set for sail in the south china sea Yes, we've heard from the Chinese foreign ministry who has called on Manila not to abuse its uh, goodwill in allowing fishing boats into this area. Um and the Philippine Coast Guard spokesman has responded saying that this is within the Philippines exclusive economic zone and it was China that with its flotilla of ships that is trespassing on its waters. So we're really seeing a more assertive Philippines under the president Marcos and that comes with the backing of the United States. The Philippines and the United States had their largest ever annual military drills that just wrapped up recently involving some 11,000 Philippine and United States troops. And this also comes um amid more frequent and more tense encounters between the Chinese Coast Guard and the Philippines Coast Guard in these disputed waters. 
That's involved the Chinese Coast Guard using water cannon and injuring some Philippine ships and its crew members. And so the worry really is amongst uh, many observers is that these increasingly combative encounters could escalate into something bigger. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Laura, for that update from there. And moving on, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi has congratulated Lawrence Wong on assuming office as Prime Minister of Singapore. Talking to ex-Prime Minister Modi said that he looked forward to working closely with him to further advance strategic partnership between India and Singapore. Wong was sworn in as the fourth Prime Minister of the Singapore on Wednesday, becoming the country's new Premier in 20 years. And Donald Trump's ex-lawyer is back on the stand on Thursday in the former U.S. president's historic hush money trial. Cross-examination of Michael Cohen by the defense is expected to continue after getting off to a fiery start on Tuesday. Trump is accused of falsifying business records in the lead-up to the 2016 presidential elections. He also pleaded not guilty and calls the trial election interference. Did India's Sally Patterson has more on this. Michael Cohen's testimony could make or break this case for the prosecution. Donald Trump's hush money trial is taking place here in New York City and the key witness is halfway through his testimony. Cohen was one time Trump's lawyer and fixer and is at the very heart of this case. He is the one who paid Stormy Daniels, an adult film star, $130,000 in order to keep her quiet about an affair she said she had with Trump 10 years before the payment allegedly took place in 2016, just before Americans headed to the polls for the presidential election. Now, Daniel says that that payment was made to try and stop her speaking out about that alleged affair, which Trump denies ever happened. Then what's being looked at here by the prosecution is whether or not Donald Trump knew and approved that payment and how he then filed it. The prosecution alleges that Trump filed it as legal expenses, something they say is in fact illegal and was an attempt to try and suppress negative information ahead of the election and keep it from the American people before they voted on their next president. Michael Cohen has spent several days now speaking about his relationship with Donald Trump, the relationship he says that they had. He says that he once called Trump's family his surrogate family, but he says he used to lie on behalf of his boss in order to try and protect him. In fact, he said, I regret doing things for him that I should not have. I violated my moral compass. That's what he told the jury when speaking about the lies he said he made on behalf of his former boss. Donald Trump has continued to call the whole case a witch hunt, saying that this is a ploy by his political opponents to try and keep him out of the White House. We also heard from his Republican allies speaking outside of court, who said that this was really a, an effort to keep Trump off of the campaign trail and inside a courtroom instead. Sally Patterson in New York reporting for DD India. Well, a barge crashed into a bridge on the Texas coast on Wednesday, forcing the closure of the only railway to a small island of the city of Galveston. No injuries were reported and the Pelican Island Bridge remained standing after the barge ran into it, although oil has spilled into the water as a result of the collision. The collision comes amid heightened concerns in the U.S. about the vulnerability of bridges to large ships after a cargo ship collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge in March. And the European Union urged Georgia on Wednesday to withdraw its highly contested foreign agents bill, saying the measure would set back the nation's ambitions to join the bloc. Georgia's parliament on Tuesday passed the third and final reading of the bill, which would require organizations receiving more than 20 percent of their funding from abroad to register as agents of foreign influence. A statement from EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell and the European Commission said the adoption of this law negatively impacts Georgia's progress on the EU path. The Georgian government has said the law is necessary to ensure the transparency of foreign funding for NGOs. Thousands of protesters against the bill blocked key intersections throughout the Tbilisi for the second day running.
On the other hand, France declared a state of emergency on the Pacific island of New Caledonia after three young indigenous Kanak and a police officer were killed in riots over electoral reform. The state of emergency will give authorities additional powers to ban gatherings and forbid people from moving around. 500 police officers were sent to the territory to reinforce current forces. Schools have been shut and through. There is already a curfew in the capital. Rioting broke out over a new bill adopted by lawmakers in Paris on May 14th that will allow French residents who have lived in New Caledonia for 10 years to vote in provincial elections. French Prime Minister Gabriel Attal and Interior Minister Gerald Darmanin held a crisis meeting on the situation. According to the government spokesperson, the state of emergency will last for 12 days. And South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa signed into a law a bill that aims to provide universal health coverage. His signing of the National Health Insurance Bill, which was passed by Parliament last year, comes two weeks before an election in which the ruling African National Congress is fighting to retain its parliamentary majority after 30 years in power. The bill will gradually limit the role of private insurance, create a new public fund to provide free access for South African citizens and set the fee and prices for products. The main opposition party, the Democratic Alliance and some labor and business groups plan to challenge the bill in court. And residents of the Chilean capital face the most intense cold snap since the middle of the last century for the southern autumn months, with low temperatures that will still continue to fall into winter. Chile's weather authorities have predicted temperatures in the central and southern part of the country would be lower than normal. The Chilean government activated Code Blue warning this week to protect and assist people living on the streets in six central and southern regions of the country. And Marvel royalty Chris Hemsworth walked the Cannes Film Festival's red carpet alongside star of the show Anaya Taylor-Joy for the first time on Wednesday night to mark the world premiere of director George Miller's much-awaited Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. The fifth Mad Max iteration comes 45 years after Miller first introduced audiences to his dystopian film universe. This time around, Furiosa is portrayed by Taylor Joy, best known for The Queen's Gambit and The Witch, as she faces off against Hemsworth as the bearded biker warlord Dementis. The film is set to hit international theatres on 22nd of May and the US on 24th of May. And now let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. The new Amy Winehouse biopic Back to Black is gearing up for American release. On 17th of May, the film portrays the life and love of the English singer. The Sam Taylor Johnson directorial gives a different perspective of the film from the Oscar-winning documentary Amy by Asif Kamadia. Netherlands is set to have the most right-wing government in the country in decades, almost six months after a major election victory. Dutch nationalist Geert Wilders said the deal had been reached to between four parties to form the government. Wilders had forfeited the position of Prime Minister to get the parties to the negotiating table after his upset election victory on the 22nd of November. And still to come in DD India News now. As the phase five of Indian general election approaches, all political parties intensify campaigning. Rescue operation still continues at the hoarding collapse accident site in Mumbai. And rain slash in Deas Tamil Nadu after scorching heat, a yellow alert issued. in the world's largest election. We help you feel the pulse of the nation. I am Sakal Bhatt. I am Shubhain Dukhosh. This election season, join us on a journey of India. We are in Assam. This is the tea city of India. From down south, Tamil Nadu. Discover the colors of democracy. 
which way to northeast of india coastal state of kerala watch pool pulse on dd india Welcome back you're watching the India News Arm let's pack shikura and time now for a quick recap of the headlines Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico out of danger after being shot multiple times government confirms it as a political assault Biden put in and European leaders condemn the attack Russian president arrives in China to deepen strategic partnership with counterpart Xi Jinping put in earlier expressed readiness for talks in Ukraine on Chinese proposal Ukrainian President Zelensky delays travel amid deteriorating situation in Kharkiv region. Russian forces capture two more settlements in Kharkiv's outskirts. Military leaders of NATO meet in Brussels. Israeli military calls for investigation after releasing video showing armed men at UN facility in Gaza. While fighting in Gaza intensifies, Hamas says Israeli amendments on ceasefire proposal led to deadlock. And India to host Bharat Parvat Khan's film festival for the first time official poster and trailer of the 55th International Film Festival of India to be unveiled today. And now let's get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. While campaigning continues in full swing for the last three phases of India's ongoing elections, voting for the fifth phase to be held on the 20th of May across 49 constituencies in six states and two union territories. Senior BJP leader and Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be holding several rallies in Uttar Pradesh today. PM Modi will campaign in Lal Ganj, Jaunpur, Badohi and Pratapgarh. BJP leader and Union Home Minister Amit Shah will be addressing rallies in Bihar's Sitamari and Madhubani. While BJP National President JP Nadda is slated to hold a road show in Bhubaneswar, he will also hold public meetings in Odisha on Thursday. And top leaders of opposition parties are also holding rallies across the country to woo the voters. Congress President Malikarjun Kharge will address a press conference in Odisha. He will also attend a public meeting in Fulbani. Congress General Secretary Priyanka Gandhi will address public meeting in Uttar Pradesh's Rai Bareilly. Samadwadi Party Chief Akhilesh Yadav will be campaigning in Uttar Pradesh. While Aam Aadmi Party Supremo and Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal will also hold a road show in Punjab's Amritsar. Well, Ladakh's lone parliamentary seat is going to polls on the 20th of May in the fifth phase of the Great Indian Democratic Elections. Did India's Gautam Roy had spoken with Ladakh's BJP candidate Tashi Gyalson about the region's key election issues ranging from development to environment and strategic concerns to regional aspirations. Take a look. It's an eco-sensitive national security sensitive zone as well and the people also have strong regional aspirations with us is uh, Tashi Gyalson he's BJP's candidate for the Lok Sabha seat here let's uh, talk to him about the election how is it going Mr Gyalson we are getting a very good response uh, everywhere almost everywhere i just uh, got back from kargil and even in kargil uh, people are uh, uh, very much excited Uh, we're hearing that uh, after the abrogation of Article 370 and uh, how the state was reorganized, JNK, and this became a union territory, uh, people have even stronger regional aspirations. How are you meeting uh, those expectations when people ask you about it? Uh, uh, people knows uh, that uh, their aspirations can only be fulfilled by BJP government. Uh, under the leadership of honorable prime minister and people what has uh, the union government done so far since 2019 uh, after the abrogation of 370 uh, in terms of the development of the region people uh, have witnessed this change in a very short span of time in spite of uh, covid hitting everywhere for example uh, uh, if you go to a uh, demjok demjok is the uh, last village it's a zero border village 
uh, in demjok uh, we uh, been able to deliver uh, the uh, you know all kind of uh, you know uh, developmental activities there we uh, we fulfill their basic essential requirement in terms of the national security concerns uh, there are charges that uh, uh, there is a constant chinese threat and uh, there have been incursions as well and uh, ladakh is under a constant uh, threat and challenge so how do you respond to those who say that uh, we're not safe uh, people are secure you know we have strengthened the border uh, in this last 5 uh, years our primary focus was to strengthen the border that is why a pro- uh, you know a project like vibrant village was introduced particularly to strengthen the border area so people are now uh, living in border uh, uh, and people are getting a better livelihood in the better there is a reverse migration that is happening in border wonderful thank you for speaking to dd india so that's uh, uh, tashi Uh, Galson who's uh, the BJP's candidate saying that uh, all the needs of the people be it security be it their aspirations will be taken care of if the BJP is uh, given another opportunity here in Ladakh uh, we'll have to see if that happens uh, when uh, it's the 28th of uh, of this month when the polling takes place and then later on on the 4th of June when the results come out with Karmvir Singh Amin Kumar Jha Gautam Roy Le Ladakh DD India While well, in the fifth phase of election seven seats from Bengal are going to polls and amongst them is the Hooghly Lok Sabha seat it is here where the infamous Singur protest and the rise of Mamta Banerjee in Bengal took place but with the TMC government in power for the last 13 years in Bengal has anything changed for the people here take a look at this special report by correspondent Dibendu Mondal from Bengal hundreds of acres of barren land that you see behind me was the reason 14 years ago when the 34 year old left rule came to an end and the trinamool congress came to power this is singur where mamta banerji then fought fiercely against the setting up of the tata nano plant here in singur politics revolved around this particular land back then in 2008 9 10 after which the mamta banerjee government came to power in 2011 what changed in the region of singur which is now in the hugli constituency how the politics have shaped in this region let's find out 17 years have passed nothing has changed for the people of singur the land is still barren their houses dilapidated and people are living in despair Unemployment has forced many to move out of this place while some landowners now resort to working as laborers and others are rearing cattle I had 3 big land one I gave on my own the other two were taken by the government we protested then but now we regret The departure of the Tatars from Bengal have left Singur dry The land which once produced the finest potatoes and the stores lined along the route to the land of Singur is a testimony. With the Tatars' departure, the hope for a better life and job for the educated youths also disappeared with the passing years. Development of this region also took a back seat. The fear of the ruling Trinamool Congress government still looms high. most refuses to speak on camera about the movement and the protest i don't want to talk about the protest it will become a problem for us i had 5 bigas of land i gave it to the tatas on my own will the politics of singur is however changing with the passing time the stronghold of the tmc here is slipping off the people although silent says there is an undercurrent for change Singur which is part of the Hooghly Lok Sabha constituency is synonymous to the downfall of the 34 years of the left rule in Bengal and the rise of Mamta Banerjee as the then fiery opposition leader Mamta and her TMC is facing a tough battle here the winds changed in 2019 when BJP's actor turned politician Lokit Chatterjee wrested the seat from the TMC This time also this Lok Sabha seat is witnessing a fierce battle between two popular contemporary actors of the Bengali cinema 
On one hand, this TMC's actor turned politician Rachana Banerjee, who is taking on BJP's Lockheed Chatterjee, who is seeking a re-election from here. The politics of Singur still revolves around the politics of land and industrialization. The reminiscence of this concrete speaks volumes about the protests that had taken place in Singur. Years have passed, but the lives of the people of Singur have not changed. They think that if the Tata plant would have not been mixed with politics, life here in Singur for the people would have been very different. With camera person PK, this is the Biendu Mondal from Singur in West Bengal for DD India. Well, the fate of two union ministers, sitting and former MPs, sitting and former MLAs would be decided when 10 seats of Mumbai and the larger Mumbai metropolitan region goes to polls during the phase five elections in Maharashtra. Let us take a look at the final phase of voting in the financial capital of India and why it matters as India decides in 2024. The two union ministers whose fate would be decided are Union Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal, who is a close aide of Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Minister of State for Panchayati Raj Kapil Patil, both from the BJP and several from political families. The seats in Mumbai going to polls are Mumbai South, Mumbai South Central, Mumbai North Central, Mumbai North East, Mumbai North West and Mumbai North. The three seats in Thane districts are Thane, Kalyan and Bhivandi. The other seat is Palghar. Of these ten seats, five involve contests between Eknath Shinde-led Shiv Sena and Uddhav Thakre-led Shiv Sena UBT. Other contests include two between BJP versus Congress, two between BJP and Shiv Sena UBT and one between BJP and Sharad Pawar-led NCP SP. Kalyan would be an interesting seat to watch as Maharashtra Chief Minister Eknath Shinde's son and two-time sitting MP Dr. Shrikant Shinde is contesting against Shiv Sena UBT's Vaishali Darikar Rane. In neighbouring Bhivandi, Minister of State for Panchayati Raj Kapil Patil of BJP is taking on Suresh alias Balyamama Mahatre of NCP. SP and Nilesh Sambare, who has support of the Prakash Ambedkar led Vanchit Bahujan Agari, VBA. In Mumbai South, two time sitting MP and former Union Heavy Industries Minister Arvind Savant of Shiv Sena UBT would take on Shiv Sena's Baikala MLA Yamini Jadhav. In Mumbai North, the Congress has fielded Bhushan Patil to take on Piyush Goyal, a BJP stalwart. Maharashtra is a political headache for the political parties, candidates and voters. However, the chance to come out and vote in the parliamentary elections is a festival of democracy. And that inked finger is surely a momentous occasion for all who believe that India has a template for the world to follow. Bureau Report, DD India. And for more on this, we're joined by our correspondent Yogesh Sheetal from Mumbai. Well, good morning to Yogesh. Uh, how is the political heat in Mumbai right now? A major battleground for many. Prime Minister Roshu was also held yesterday. All right, good morning, Lipak Chair. You have also rightly, uh, you know, uh, explained in your story how the preparations are made and why Mumbai is very important, not only because of financial uh, capital, uh, uh, Mumbai, because of other regions also coming to BMC, which is one of the richest yes. municipal corporations uh, located in, in Mumbai. And also uh, many prominent leaders here, particularly they are uh, talking about Union Minister Pius well is, is contesting, Dr. Bharti Power is contesting from Nandari Nasik, uh, which is going to poll in the fifth and final phase in Maharashtra. So a lot of factors coming to the issues as far the major issues are concerned the major issue would be development obviously for, from the bjp and nda side but coming to uh, uh, sena versus sena contest because recently we had seen the split in Shiv uh, sena and also in uh, ncp so there are three constituencies south mumbai south central and northwest in these three constituencies there's direct contest between sena and sena you can see uh, uh, we can say that Sena uh, led by uh, Eknath Shinde and Sena led by Uddhav Balasab Thakre. So this will definitely make the entire uh, uh, you know election very interesting in Mum in Mumbai. Coming to other pockets, you have also right-sided Kalyan, 
पालघर और इवन नासिक देर आर अदर कंस्टिट्यूएंस देर आर टोटल थर्टीन कंस्टिट्यूएंसी विच आर गोइंग टू पोल इन दिस फेज सो कमिंग टू ऑल कंस्टिट्यूएंसी वन बाय वन यस दिस फेज द फाइनल फेज विल डिसाइड द फेट ऑफ ऑल द यू नो द लीडरशिप लीडरशिप पोटेंशियल ऑफ टॉप लीडर्स इन ऑल सिक्स पार्टीज फोर पार्टीज बोथ शिवसेना एंड बोथ एन सी पी एंड टू बीजेपी एंड कांग्रेस सो ऑल द लीडर्स एंड ऑल द यू नो द स्टार कैंपेनर्स आर ट्राइंग देयर बेस्ट लिविंग नो स्टोन एंड टर्न टू कन्विंस द वोटर्स एंड रीच आउट टू द लास्ट वोटर्स टू एंश्योर दैट दे गेट अपर हैंड इन दिस फेज राइट और राइट ऑल्सो योगेश Uh, restaurants in Mumbai announced 20% discount for voters on a lighter note what are the other incentives being announced for the people who vote see the party we have seen in mumbai uh, such measures are taken by uh, restaurants and sometimes the bst also sometimes the private uh, you know private business uh, uh, you can say the uh, business lobby or business organizations also they just try to mitigate the effect of urban apathy which is a concern and which has been you know raised uh, uh, multiple times by the election commission also that urban apathy is a concern th that lead uh, that led to a uh, voter turnout less voter turnout so mumbai a uh, financial capital a lot of migrants populations are also residing in mumbai so if uh, they are vacation they want to go back to their home so basically the attempt is to the attempt is made to ensure that they uh, participate in the election they exercise their franchise and the ultimate objective of the election commission to bring them from their uh, you know uh, their house to the uh, polling booth so these all our measures are taken yes you have rightly said some restaurants have announced uh, some uh, sort of concession at the same time some uh, facilities are also provided to the private uh, uh, you know uh, private companies because we know there are lot of private company basically corporate bodies located in mumbai there are offices there are uh, you know there uh, their wings are there so right. they also uh, you know uh, that encourage their workers to cast their vote go to the polling booth cast their vote without sacrificing their one day salary so such attempts are being made such uh, efforts are being made we can all say. right voting is most important there thank you so much yogesh for joining us and giving us that update and moving on india is experiencing the pinnacle of democracy with the general elections 2024 the country is witnessing an impressive turnout of over 18 million first time voters let us look have at what the youth have to say in kirat chavla's report for dd india the essence of democracy is embodied by the decisive diligent and dutiful youth of any nation and india proudly houses world's largest youth population as india's general election progresses over 18 million first time voters are making their presence felt in the 2024 elections a staggering 194.7 million individuals aged 20 to 29 are engaging in the electoral process reflecting a population where over 50% are under the age of 25 as the young voters step into their roles as citizens It's imperative that they understand the importance of exercising their right to vote. Since times immemorial when I was in school we have been taught and imbibed in our mind that democracy is of the people by the people and for the people and to live that code it is very important and pertinent for all of us to go out and vote. If you want to change the society if you want something to uh, happen in the country you have to you have to go to vote first. Having the chance to vote and express concerns through this opportunity their active involvement in the electoral process directs the nation's path for the years ahead uh, vote is a matter of privilege and uh, for me the issue is going to be the education one uh, because i believe education is the one thing which impacts in the entirety of indian community i would be concerned about the good leader and beside that i would be going for a good candidate who is from my constituency who would help me and my area to develop according to me is being able to give given the power that i myself can choose a political party that can rule this huge of a country so that is pretty exciting for me and from the corridors of university of delhi we've delved into the hopes and perspectives of india's first time voters and as the nation continues its journey to the ballot boxes their influence is set to leave an impact on our future with video journalist vishwabandhu kirat chavla for dd india in new delhi 
Shifting focus, India at the Cannes Film Festival will see India hosting a Bharat Parva for the first time. It will be a networking evening where Indian talent and opportunities will be showcased and the two marquee film festival of India, MIF and IFI, will be promoted. The official poster and trailer of the 55th India International Film Festival to be held in Goa in November will be unveiled at the Bharat Parva. The Bharat Parva will also see the release of Save the Date for the first world audiovisual and entertainment summit waves to be hosted alongside the 55th IFI. The day will also see a number of round tables at the Bharat Pavilion on co-producing with India. India, the complete filming destination, the magic of authentic storytelling and convergence of technology in filmmaking. And now let's take a look at other stories making news today. The death toll in Mumbai hoarding collapse rose to 16 on Wednesday as the National Disaster Response Force recovered two more bodies from a car stuck at the accident site. Rescue operations still continues, though hoarding collapsed due to a sudden dust storm and heavy rain that hit Mumbai in Maharashtra capital city. South India's Tamil Nadu got some respite from scorching heat as the rain slashed the city on Wednesday. The regional meteorological department has issued a yellow alert for the next five days for several districts in the state. And on to some business news now. Asian stock markets rallied on Thursday, buoyed by Wall Street surge to all time peak overnight. The dollar remained on a downtrend, sagging to fresh multi week lows against peers, including the euro and sterling. Gold marched back towards record levels, and crude oil added to gains after rebounding strongly overnight from a two month throw. Fed Fund's future shows 52 basis points of cuts this year, with one in September now fully priced. Asia-Pacific shares outside Japan climbed 1.44%, Hong Kong's Hang Seng advanced 0.9%, while Australia's stock benchmark rallied 1.5%. And you're watching DD India News. Our time now for some sports news. Juventus beat Atlanta 1-0 to win a record extending 15th Coppa Italia on Wednesday as an early strike. But Dusan Blahovic earned the club their first trophy in three years. The club also holds the record for most Italian Cup finals played in one. However, they had not lifted any silverware since they won the competition in 2020-21 when they also beat Atlanta in the final. Meanwhile, Juventus coach Massimiliano Allegri became the first coach to win the Coppa Italia five times after Sven Goran Eriksson and Roberto Mancini lifted the trophy on four occasions. And reigning Olympic and world champion Rita Chopra backed gold medal at the 27th Federation Cup Senior Athletics Championship in Bhubaneswar on Wednesday. The star javelin thrower registered a best throw of 82.27 meters on his fourth attempt to claim the top honor. DP Manu, who remained at the pole position till round three with a best throw of 82.06 meter, failed to overtake Neeraj later on the competition. The star player marked his return in the Federation Cup after three years as he took the field at the Kalinga. Stadium. During his last appearance at the event, Neeraj had pulled off a throw of 87.80 meter to win gold in 2021. And in IPL, Punjab Kings skipper Sam Curran starred with 63 as they defeated the already, already qualified Rajasthan Royals by five wickets at the Baraspara Cricket Stadium in Guwahati on Wednesday. Avesh Khan and Zuzwendra Chahel picked two wickets apiece but failed to win the game for their side. Earlier, Rian Parag's fighting knockoff 48 of 34 steered RR to 144 for nine in 20 overs after the side opted to bat first, chasing a modest target of 144. Five on a tricky surface, PPKs reached home in 18.5 overs. Sam Curran, Rahul Chahar and Harshal Patel all picked two wickets each. A national double squash championship concluded at the Indian Squash Academy in Chennai on Wednesday. The Squash Racket Federation of India, in association with HCL, has revived the national double championship, which kick started on Monday. Abhay Singh and Joshna Chinappa clinched the mixed double title, while Singh with Velawan Senthikumar won gold in the men's double with the score of 2 0. Pooja Arthi and Radhika Seelan won women's doubles title with the score of 2-1.
All right, that's all for this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. For those on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates from India and across the world on the DD India mobile app. The app is available on both Android and iOS platforms. Scan the QR code on the screen to download now. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Lupak Shukrana from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India News Hour.